And that, my friends, is how America was made great once again. Breaking at this hour, Jimmy Sangenberger is currently at the crossroads of politics and economics. Radio broadcaster master, now the celeb on the web. He's the smarty of the party. He's in cahoots with the grassroots. Jimmy at the Crossroads brings you thought-provoking commentary, hard-hitting interviews, original satire, and the best bumper music known to man. Jimmy at the Crossroads! Gonna talk money, gonna talk politics. We're for all generations. Oh, what a great mix, I said. Gonna talk money, gonna talk politics. Grateful to all generations. Oh, what a great mix. I got Jimmy and the Crossroads making sense out of nonsense. People want answers. They want to understand. They come to the crossroads and Jimmy gives them the plan. I said, gonna talk money. Gonna talk politics. Great for all generations. Oh, what a great mix. I got Jimmy and the crossroads making sense out of nonsense. Come on, Jimmy, what you got? Markets, elections, current events, the broadcast master throws us how to win. I said, Policy and markets, elections, and current events. Hello, my friends, and welcome to another edition of Jimmy at the Crossroads on a free to choose Friday where we're indeed making sense out of nonsense or at least doing our level best here. On this show, such a pleasure and a privilege to be with you once again in partnership with the Washington Examiner on the show that brings you engaging, intelligent talk, saying style. Thanks so much for joining us. It is such a pleasure and a privilege to be with you. If you have not subscribed to the YouTube channel, please do so. Jimmy at the Crossroads on YouTube, youtube.com slash Jimmy at the Crossroads. Also, be sure to like the Facebook page, Jimmy Sangenberger Media Personality. That's Facebook.com slash Jimmy Sangenberger Pro. And then also be sure to like or follow my Twitter feed, at Sang Center. That's saying with an E, not an A, Center on Twitter, which is one way to engage in the conversation. Plus, Jimmy at the Crossroads.com, the place to go. For all of our videos collected there and additional content, plus the shop where you can buy some incredible merchandise, love the shirts that we've got, and more. And also you can join the Crossroads Club membership program. In addition, please be sure to follow and like, subscribe to our friends at the Washington Examiner at WashingtonExaminer.com on Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter. So great to be with you on another Free to Choose Friday. And why do we call it Free to Choose Friday? Well, in part to honor the late, great Milton Friedman, who wrote the book Free to Choose and also had a program in 1980, his own show of that exact name. But also because we believe here on this program firmly that every human being, each and every one of us, ought to be free to think, free to act, and free to choose. And as we begin normally on a Free to Choose Friday, let's watch how Milton Friedman would open his show, Free to Choose.
On today's edition of Free to Choose Friday here on Jimmy at the Crossroads with yours truly, Jimmy Sangenberger, and of course in partnership with the Washington Examiner, I want to dive in to understanding the radical left. And that includes understanding what's happening with these protest movements and some of their significance. And who better to talk about this with than somebody who himself, especially during the tumultuous 1960s, was a Marxist radical who was so far to the left that he and his comrades bolted from the Communist Party because it wasn't radical enough. It was, as I like to say, too kino for him. That is, communist in name only. Retired psychotherapist, Ph.D. psychologist, and... Also, a Buddhist teacher and, as I said, former psychotherapist, Dr. Marv Traeger, now a conservative and a Trump fan, joins us here on Jimmy at the Crossroads. Marv, my friend, welcome to the show. Well, thank you, Jimmy. It's good to see you. It's good to see you as well. I appreciate you being along for the ride today. And I'm so excited about what we're going to dive into here on the program. I want to give you an opportunity first to tell us a little bit about your story. Just sort of origin here, 1960s, you were a radical leftist involved in the movements of that era. How did you get roped up in far left activism? How did I get roped up? Well, I was... uh... In 1961, I was down in, um, I was working for a buck and a quarter an hour, about 20 hours a week. Ended up in Washington Square Park. The revolution had just taken place and there was a lot of uh, buzz and excitement about it. And um, people were talking, it was a free speech area. And there was a speaker and he was up there uh, talking about it. And I, and I was listening, making total sense. And then somebody asked him about Hungary and to what sounded to me at the time like Hungary. So he supported the Cuban revolution, but he also supported the Soviet troops, the Hungarian. I thought, wow, what's going on? So as I'm standing there, I see a guy's coming up to the, to the platform where he's speaking look good and so I kind of walk over and I kind of get between them and the guy spits at him catches me in the face the speaker invites me for coffee after. he and his African-American wife and at their home on Amsterdam and 125th in Harlem and for the next 10 weeks I studied Marxism Leninism and came out a commie Came out a commie. That is quite something. Um, and I apologize. You were cutting in and out. We figured out. We, we know what's going on. You were cutting in and out for just snippets of that story. But we basically got it, Marv Traeger. We're working on fixing the, the connection. It's on our end, I believe. But uh, in terms I'm of— I'm hearing the, it also from your end. That's better now. You're, that's you're it. also— I think I think we're I think we're better now. The intro was not quite right. Okay, so I, th- I think we're getting a little bit better now. So I apologize. We occasionally these technical glitches happen with the internet and so forth. So, uh, Marv, <clears throat> what was it about Marxist Leninism that really brought you into the fold, and not just into the fold ideologically, but also where you became very involved in movements like Students for a Democratic Society. You went and participated in a sit-in in solidarity with Selma and engaged in other activities. What was it that got you so motivated to become active? Well, uh, I would say that um, early on as a teenager, I became anti-fascist after studying the Holocaust. And uh, and uh, and then I noticed that the uh, that the communists very often, when they're out of power, support uh, causes where there's some injustice, and sometimes they're they're at the forefront, even though maybe uh, secretly, but they're involved deeply. So they were involved in the civil rights movement. They were involved in. Uh, anti-war movement. They were involved in these different things. Of course, for the communists, this was simply a stepping stone itself. And when um, many, many, many years later, there was a reunion of the old comrades, and they invited me, even though I was way off doing something else. 
And at, the, at that uh, meeting, I said to them uh, in a circle at the end, I said, the greatest blessing of my life was that I was part of a movement that never came to power. So the communists can sometimes do good things when there's injustice, but they use it to come into power and then forget about it. Oh. So, Marv, what are a few of the activities that you engaged in back in the 1960s? I mean, I know that you were at the meeting of the Students for Democratic Society major convention when the, what became later known as the Weather Underground, the weathermen, broke off, and you ended up in a separate direction. So tell us a little bit about a few of the things that you were engaged in during that time of the tumultuous 60s. Well, uh, uh, as a kind of uh, concept or idea of participatory democracy and a new form of small d democracy uh, spread like wildfire on the campuses and ended up having tens and tens of thousands of members. And they had a convention in 68, which had about 3,000 attendees. But by 68, what had happened was Marxist factions had come to completely control all the different major groups within SDS. And um, so uh, the, our group, which was the radical youth movement, part of SDS, which was uh, linked to Bernadine Dorn and Bill Ayers and Michael Klonsky and Noel Ignatin, who was a originator of white privilege and all of that sort of thing, um, it, they de we, we decided that we had to break off from the old-fashioned communists, and so a big speech was given, and the convention was split absolutely in two with Bernadine Dorden's speech, and I spent the last 45 minutes of her speech with her, uh, helping her to tweak it. Um, <laughs> the next day, the rump of that convention formed a new convention, and that convention... Um, was going to be led by an executive committee of three. I was nominated for education sec uh, secretary. We were the smaller group. But the people that eventually became weathermen decided to take everything. And so Bill Ayers became the educational secretary. And um, uh, that group split. So from 3,000 members, we were, you know, it was down to about 300 and about 250. And let me tell you, um, that was the second blessing of my life, because had I been s s uh, pulled into the whole weather man thing, it would have been a whole different outcome. That is such, uh, no, I, I don't know of anybody else, at least I don't know anybody else, who was defeated by Bill Ayers of all people in some kind of an election. In your case, it was to become education secretary of a radical leftist organization, which is really quite something. But you also, I mean, you went and spoke to high schools against the uh, in opposition to the Vietnam War, as I noted before, you also participated in a sit-in, this is in California, in solidarity with the Selma March. So you were engaged in a lot of different activities over a period of about how many years, would you say? Um, I would say that uh, I, I joined the party in 1962, and uh, I, I left formal politics in 1972 and a lot of people you know it's a revolving door a lot of people go in my apologies oh. folks we're having a little bit of signal issues now still with dr marv traeger our guest joining us here on jimmy at the crossroads of course uh, marv is a former marxist radical for quite some time, especially during the 1960s, involved in radical leftist movements. And then most recently, he has become, and I want to get to this, a uh, conservative and also even supports President Trump. And he's still a Buddhist teacher as well. He became a Buddhist and a Buddhist teacher. And we're going to dive into that here in just one moment on Jimmy at the Crossroads when we bring back Dr. Marv Traeger, good friend. He is quite insightful when it comes to understanding the left and where they are at today and in the past. So we're going to take a, a quick pause here and we will be back in just one moment with Dr. Marv Traeger here on Jimmy at the Crossroads.
Do you suffer from feelings of entitlement, self-righteousness, and arrogance? Fits of resentment, anger, and hypocrisy. Terror that the world is going to end, or even worse, that the world isn't going to end and that things are gonna get better. A deep need to point fingers, deflect or deny. Uncontrollable stress, frustration or depression. Fear of recession, fear of no recession. Then you may have PTDS or President Trump derangement syndrome. Fortunately, there's new Magatol, the proven cure for PTDS. Just one Magatol a day realigns your sensibilities by bypassing erratic brain signals to amplify the logic receptors. Talk to your Obamacare doctor today to see if Magatol is right for you. Recommended dose of reality is at least once daily. Warning snowflakes. Side effects of Magatol may include optimism, hope for the future, good feelings about your country, accepting economic prosperity, renewed faith in capitalism, and admitting that things aren't so bad under Trump. If you discover you're allergic to common sense, stop use immediately and contact your doctor. Relax, breathe, ah, it's Magatol. From the makers of Triggerall, Jimmy at the crossroads. Welcome back. Good to be with you. Getting Dr. Marv Traeger back on with us here on the show that brings you engaging, intelligent talk, saying style in partnership with the Washington Examiner. Such a pleasure and a privilege to be with you today on this free to choose Friday. Dr. Marv Traeger is a former Marxist radical who for years was involved in radical leftist movements, as we just heard him describe. He knew Bill Ayers, who was an advisor, friend to Barack Obama. Remember, 2008 election cycle. That was a big thing that conservatives were bringing up was Obama's relationship with Bill Ayers. I think, if I recall correctly, I think Ayers raised money for Obama's campaigns. So Marv knew Bill Ayers and Bernadine Dorn, and actually when there was this breakup of Students for Democratic Society, the radical leftist group in the 1960s, he lost to Bernadine Dorn in an election, excuse me, lost to Bill Ayers in an election over education secretary of the radical group and then that group then became the weather underground the weathermen which would go on and perpetrate some terrorist acts certainly a lot of acts of violence during that tumultuous time and Marv did not end up going in that route what's so striking too and we'll get to this momentarily here is what brought about what he calls his Roto-Rooter process, where he completely changed his ideological perspective from being somebody who wrote a speech for Bernadine Dorn or helped her write a speech onto splitting off and doing a different route than they did and eventually becoming a conservative, and particularly because of September 11th, 2001. Marv is also a Buddhist teacher who does different solitary retreats and other activities of the sort, which is one of the things that helped 
address his his process. So we're going to take one more little break here on Jimmy at the Crossroads. We're going to be doing a phone call with Dr. Marv Traeger now here in just one moment. So keep it right here. Don't go anywhere. It's Jimmy at the Crossroads. I'm Jimmy Sangenberger. Concerned about that trade deficit? Looking for that magic solution? I'm Bill of Goods for ScamWow, the tariff towel. It's like a tax. It's like a fee. It's like a penalty. This tariff really sucks up the trade deficit. And the jobs will save are tremendous. This is for the House, the Senate, the POTUS. You'll be saying crap every time you use the ScamWow tariff towel. Look at this. It just does the work. Why wouldn't you want to pay twice the price for that washing machine? How much would you pay for this tariff? It'll make this microwave seem like it's brand new. And at only twice the price. Look at the way the tariff towel cleans your clock. Wow, look at that. So clean, you can see the future. You can see future tariffs coming from a mile away. Look at the way it polishes these stars. Boy, if that don't make you feel patriotic, huh? I love paying extra. I don't even worry about it anymore, since the trade deficit will go down. Look at this tariff. I love this tariff. It's like a security blanket. All I can say is, scam wow! Scam wow compels other nations to use their own tariff towels on our stuff, making our goods more expensive overseas. Whoopee. The micro tariff is for everything, for lumber, for steel, even solar panels. It'll melt that trade deficit down. I don't know. It sells itself, America. The scam well sells for 25%. But if you call in the next 20 minutes, because we can't do this all term, we'll give you the second tariff absolutely free. That's four tariffs for 25%. And it comes with a five-year warranty. Here's how to work. Call 1-800-RIP-YOU-OFF. ScamWow is not available in capitalism and is made in Washington. Beware of ScamWow grift. 1-800-RIP-YOU-OFF. Call now. All right, Jimmy at the Crossroads, we're back here now. Sometimes you got to make some changes on the fly. Welcome back to the program. I am Jimmy Sangenberger coming to you in partnership with the Washington Examiner. Once again, we are talking with Dr. Marv Traeger now joining us via the telephone. Marv, can you hear me okay, my friend? I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you just fine. Thank you very much. I appreciate you bearing with us <laughs> for this. Okay, so I want to take a, a step back and ask you for just a moment to kind of summarize everything you just told us. <laughs> <laughs> well, where, where did it leave off? You know, what the, the, the thing that stuck in my mind from where we left off was where you were talking about the SDS convention uh, and the splitting off from that group when you lost, after you lost your race for education secretary against none other than the infamous Bill Ayers. And after having helped Bernadine Dorn write a very seminal speech for that convention. Well, helped her tweak it at any rate. Um, sure. Uh, she had it all written out. But, uh, yeah, okay. So, um, so that was a, a split. That split took place uh, at the big SDS convention. And then the following day at our rump convention, another split. And at that point, um, uh, uh, the group that was the majority uh, morphed uh, soon into the weathermen. And so I was very happy to not have been part of that because uh, that would have been completely against uh, my uh, understanding, uh, approach, and principles. So, um, uh, uh, so that to me was the second blessing of my life. <laughs> After having, um, uh, you know, confessed to my comrades at one point that the first blessing right. of my life was that I was never part of a movement that came to power, and and that led me to the point that. People uh, come in and out of the left movement. Uh, you, you've probably met some, many here and there. They're all around. And um, they are no longer activists. Um, they've rejected formal politics in that regard. But they still hold to the world view. And that is the problem. That still, that once it's in their brain, 
they tend to keep it the rest of their lives and never examine it and deconstruct it. And I believe that what you have to do is to take a roto rooter to yeah. your brain uh, and and clear it out and clean it out and um, you know make make room for spirituality and for a deeper understanding of um, right. the nature of things, all of that stuff, and restudy America and its extraordinary history and the history of Western civilization sure. s- to substitute for the old worldview. And I, I want to just ask one more question before we jump into the Roto-Rooter process. I mentioned in my introduction earlier that you and a bunch of comrades bolted from the Communist Party because it was too, as I like to say, kino for you, communist in name only. Why was the Communist Party not radical enough for a young Marv Traeger in the 1960s? Well, uh, ironically, uh, from the standpoint of effectiveness in the movements of the day, they were right and I was wrong or partially wrong. The the Communist Party worked behind the scenes so that, for example, they were already uh, strongly influencing the Democratic Party in California where I was working and strongly influenced trade unions, even though they were at a low mark in, in their American history, uh, you know, after the Khrushchev revelations of Stalin from 1956, their membership was at its lowest, but they were still quite influential. So just to give you an example, there was a major demonstration in 1967 called the Century City Plaza demonstrations against Lyndon Baines Johnson and the war. And uh, tens of thousands of people showed up uh, for that demonstration. And there was a great umbrella organization, the Peace Action Council. Well, it was led by a communist. And then there was the Women's Strike for Peace. Well, that was led by a communist. And uh, more than half of the different organizations under the umbrella were led by communists. However, the membership of all these organizations were ordinary people who were uh, wanting to fight around some particular issue. Well, the end result of the Century City Plaza demonstrations, just to sum it up real quickly, is that it ended up in a violent confrontation between the police and the demonstrators. And um, uh, and that exposed, uh, that turned the white middle class against the Vietnam War in Los Angeles and split the Democratic Party. Lyndon Baines Johnson was never able to go out again to any city in the country. And a few months later, he decided not to run for office again. Well, the Communist Party succeeded in, on that day in changing national politics, but doing so more or less behind the scenes. Well, so, but to me, it, they weren't radical enough and they weren't front again, up front enough and forward enough. And so I moved to the left and the country was moving, the, the movement was moving to the left at that time. And so then the Black Panther Party, they were the big vanguard and uh, holding up Mao's little book. And um, and then the uh, the white radicals tended to see themselves as an auxiliary or sidecar uh, to the uh, black movement, which was starting to rise. And that movement was more radical, finally leading to the violence of Weatherman. This is so interesting. We're going to come back to this because I'm, I'm hearing some resonance with what we're seeing right now with the current civil <laughs> unrest and protests in there, Dr. Marv Traeger. But before we get to that, I want to ask you, you described a little bit about some of the things that need to happen for a rotor rooter process, as you describe it, in order to move from being a very far left individual like yourself on to ultimately embracing the tenets of freedom and the idea that we value so much here on this very program that we should be free to think, free to act, and free to choose. In other words, you became a conservative. Tell us a little bit about that and especially how also your Buddhist faith and your Buddhist teacher, how that fits into this too. Well, I think a key aspect of this is, um, uh, remember, uh, communism is based upon atheism, and that's also linked to secularism, and that's also linked to elevating science as the sole god, uh, which is really scientism, not really science. So, therefore, a connection to spirituality, to religion, in some fashion, undermines the uh, 
fundamental underpinnings of atheism. So for me, Buddhism did that. And it did it, oh, you know, like with sandpaper, gradually over a period of time, sort of undermining the foundations. So um, that was going on for, uh, a, you know, a couple of decades and uh, three decades, actually. Uh, and um, so but finally, what came to pass was um, I was in retreat in 2001 and uh, seven months that year I was in retreat and three months in solitary retreat. And my wife said to me before I went into retreat, solitary, she said, honey, do you want to know what's going on in the world politically? Because I always like to follow it. And and I said, no, baby, (laughs) uh, unless it's on the level of Pearl Harbor. Well, sure enough, uh, you know, 9-11 happened. And um, uh, and so she sent me word. I'm a little isolated cabin in the northwest and I get this message. Um, and uh, it's delivered to me uh, by hand, and um, all of a sudden, my mind was very clear, my heart was very open, and it was like I saw the future. I mean, you know, not in a Nostradamus kind of way, but I saw it just because I knew some history and politics, and I was very open, and what I saw was that um, the radical left was going to form a de facto alliance with Islamism, or with whatever force was against America, because that was the common enemy. Mm. And I knew that we were in for it. And I made a vow while in retreat that when I got out, I was going to uh, re-examine and re-study uh, all the foundations that made us the most extraordinary civilization that has yet been on Earth. Was there any particular book or thinker that especially resonated with you after you got out of retreat, Dr. Marv Traeger, to help inspire this trajectory that led towards more of a conservative mindset? Well, there were many, but I would say that uh, the book that probably uh, moved me and impressed me the most was by Thomas Sowell, the great African-American historian from Stanford and the Hoover Institute. And, uh, yeah, economist and sociologist and uh, philosopher and political comment. I mean, he's 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 an all purpose guy. And uh, volume three of his trilogy uh, entitled Conquest and Culture um, really did it for me because he introduced me to some fantastic, extraordinary history and geography but and economics, but also to the idea that every people has a psychic culture and that uh, it's very, very important that the uh, elements of its own elevation must come from individuals who then spread it to other individuals within their own culture. And unless that happens, all the outside interest, compassion, help, welfare isn't going to cut it. It's not going to change it fundamentally. Mm. It has to, in the last analysis, come from inside the psychic culture. And uh, Sol then studied all kinds of different cult- the psychic cultures of all these different peoples. And, and uh, it was a, it's a work of genius, and I recommend it to your, to your listeners. Dr. Marv Traeger, again, our guest here on Jimmy at the Crossroads. One thing that I want to get to before we take a a brief break and then jump into the protest movements and and so forth and get to what's happening today and how that can resonate with the 60s and what lessons we should learn. I want to get a basic understanding of the far left right now as to where you see things as being at, especially when you trace back to the Marxist ideologies that – in a lot of ways, they seem to be espousing, but also the modern left seems to be a little bit separated from uh, some of the traditional notions of, of coming together on a class basis. Now there seems to be some interesting racial elements that play into this a little bit more even than class to some extent. But I'm curious uh, your thoughts on what we need to know overall about the radical left and then also about the left today and anything that it might have changed. Well, um, I would say that uh, it's it really important to understand identity politics exactly. and its origins. 
So uh, what are its origins? Basically, it's a class war or class struggle. What was the original identity politics? It was Marxism and the working class, not each individual worker, not somebody who became a worker, uh, uh, who came down from the middle class or who went up to the middle class or who even became wealthy. No, it was the notion of a group defined by, in that case, an economic position in society. And so, therefore, justice became associated with justice for a group. And the truth of it is, there's no such thing as social justice. That should shock any leftist no. who tuned in. There's only individual justice, because everything that is done either uh, legally, illegally, fairly, unfairly, right or wrong, is always done by an individual. He may gather with other individuals, and so those individuals uh, do it, but he must be tried, he must be submitted to the bar of justice as an individual. You can't submit groups to the bar of justice. If you do, then you immediately create divisions and sectarianism in society. One of the reasons why the Soviet Union fell was they were continually making the case that only workers should be in position. This worker should be in position. If a person was a, a brilliant engineer, it didn't matter if he hadn't been from the working class. And so the, everything started to get reduced to a common theme. The second issue connected to identity politics is the fact that ideologically you agree with and advocate identity politics. In other words, uh, and in the communist movement, the slogan that captured that was better red than dead. So in other words, um, um, uh, 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 you know, they, would, they would promote people who had the right ide ideology. So the mix of the right political line with the right identity was what determined your advance in society. That can only be done by a central controlling operation. It ends up totalitarian, and it has nothing to do with justice. So interesting, and it really goes down to this point, too, since this is free to choose Friday, Marv, and that is individuals can choose and make choices about what they're going to do for actions. They may get grouped together with others, but they're still making that choice one way or another. And in a free society, the idea is that you should be free to choose whatever path you would like as long to take, as long as it doesn't violate the individual rights of other individuals. But the collectivist notion that you're describing, rooted in this sort of identity politics ma mindset, is it seems to me, fundamentally about how no individuals should not be free to choose. Instead, we should try to control it in order to achieve some mythical notion of social justice, control the individuals instead of giving them freedom to choose because we need to achieve this goal of social justice. Yeah, that's a pretty good summary. Very well said. Um, Friedrich Engels, you know, who was Karl Marx's partner and collaborator, Friedrich Engels once said, that freedom, this was his definition of freedom, freedom is the appreciation of necessity. So freedom is not actually, for Marxists, about choice. It's about appreciating necessity. Now, what does that mean? What is the necessity? Well, the necessity uh, in question was the um, um, march of history toward a, a preordained goal which was the goal of full and complete equality of all beings uh, under communism. And um, so therefore, anything that advanced it was freedom. Anything that stood in the way of it was not freedom. Choice was not part of the equation. And I think that one of the things that underscores this point is if you listen to the left right now, they say, well, freedom, you're not really free if you can't afford this service or that product. That's not freedom when you cannot afford those things. We should have the government provide it, and then you will be free, whereas a conservative or a libertarian will say, no, freedom is when you as an individual have the choice to do something, the ability to think 
act and choose without having to go to the government for permission. And I think that idea gets at the core of what you're saying. Yeah, um, I, I, I would put emphasis on uh, the uh, latter uh, syllable, as the expression goes. Um, uh, the people who are going to decide who um, is free and uh, who is going to uh, get what they need, that group invariably holds power, and right. power corrupts. Absolute power corrupts absolutely. So therefore, they're going to always take care of themselves and their own before they'll take care of anyone else. And so the slogans, which are fine and beautiful, nevertheless are never implemented. So there never comes a time when, in fact, everyone is, in fact, made equal. And that problem goes back even before Karl Marx. It goes back to the philosophy of Rousseau. And um, uh, so, uh, and it, it was the slogan for the French Revolution, which was also before Karl Marx. And that is this notion of an absolute equal outcome for every person. And until then, we can condemn all other differences from that endpoint as being oppressive, unjust, racist, classist, you name it. And this absolutely obliterates the uniqueness distinction of every individual and of the human race and of the fact that <laughs> if you're parents and you have two children, by the time you get the second one, you know that two, two human beings are completely different from one another. Goodness, isn't that true? Dr. Marv Traeger, our guest here on Jimmy at the Crossroads, former Marxist radical. Before we go to our break, I do want to play one clip. So Milton Friedman is our patron economist here on Free to Choose Fridays. And in cut to, I want to play this one where Friedman is talking about socialism and a, a conversation he had with someone from Poland who was then uh, back in Poland had been arrested and what have you. But in a conversation with him, this guy was a socialist viewing it as an ideal, but not something that could work in a real, the real world until something was achieved. And it resonates quite well with what you're telling us. So take a listen. This is Milton Friedman back around 19, late 1970s, early 1980s. On this same trip that we took to Russia, we stopped in Poland, in Warsaw, for a while, and we met there a marvelous man, a man by the name of Edward Lipinski, who was in this country a year ago at the age of 83 or 4, I believe was arrested when he got back to Poland because he had been one of those who had signed and authored a declaration against the suppression of, of freedom of thought and speech in Poland. But at the time we met Edward Lipinski, he was, seemed to be fairly free, he is a, was a man who had been a socialist all his life. And this was really very hard for, he was now in his 70s, I may say, when we saw him, he was retired. Very hard thing for a man to go back on all of his lifelong beliefs. And so he said as follows to us, he said, you know, he said, I used to believe in socialism, I still do. But socialism is an ideal. We can't have it in the real world, he said, until we're rich enough to be able to afford it. And he said, socialism will be practical when every man in Poland has a house and two servants. And I said to him, including the servants? And he said, yes. <laughs> now, so there's, a little bit. there's a little bit of Milton Friedman for you, Dr. Marv Traeger, telling a story of a, an exchange with Edward Lipinski, a socialist from Poland. What do you make of that? I, th I think that was a pretty apt point. Well, uh, 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 dear Mr. Uh, Lipsinski, is that his name, Lipsinski? Yes, yes. Uh, yeah. Uh, well, he had not sufficiently taken that Roto-Rooter to his brain. That yeah. was the problem with him. Mm -hmm. uh, and it, that's a perfect example of just how this thing, as I was talking about earlier, how, how this thing works. Yes, it's uh, not practical. Socialism is not practical. But yes, I still support socialism because it's a beautiful ideal, and uh, and it'll happen when the following uh, and Marx made the case that socialism could only come uh, when the most advanced capitalist countries went over to socialism. It couldn't happen in a third world country because you needed a certain level of prosperity to reach socialism, um, and of course that never 
unfolded or took place and the working class uh, did, did, wanted to move up to the middle class. They didn't want to overthrow the government. And um, so, so all of these things were utopian, but uh, Lipchinsky is still hanging on to bits and pieces of the Marxist outlook, uh, even though there he is in Poland. My God. Yeah, I think that's a very important point, Marv, where sometimes what we see is a situation where people do say, well, ideally we would have a socialist society, but it can't work, so let's not go to it. I'm with you. Even in an ideal world, socialism is still not the way to go, still horrific, still a violation fundamentally of individual rights and the ideal. The ideal is a small and limited government with a maximally capitalist system, in my view. But Dr. Marv Traeger is our guest. We're going to take a quick break here on Jimmy at the Crossroads. When we come back, I want to dive in to the current political dynamics that we're facing as a country in terms of the protest movements and the riots and the destruction of property that's happening across the country, some of what Marv said earlier really came to mind here today and what we're facing as a nation in the United States of America in the year 2020. Keep it right here. It's Jimmy at the Crossroads coming to you in partnership with the Washington Examiner. America's politics are crazy. The culture is in flux. That's why we work hard to help you keep up more politics, more culture, and more access. We focus on the biggest stories of the day with some of the biggest names in politics and punditry. Go to our website, WashingtonExaminer.com. Subscribe to our YouTube channel. Be sure to follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Safe, unsafe. Very safe, completely unsafe. Extremely insanely safe. X Games, unsafe. Who's there? What do you want? It's me, Arnold. Don Trump, I need to ask you a favor. I need you to stop using my quotes and my movie titles in your speeches. When you talk to the public, it gives them the wrong idea that somehow I support you. I can do whatever I want. I am, after all, Commando-in-Chief. Ah, that's what I mean right there. You can't just blatantly rip people off. That is a movie that I was in, not you, me. I can do as I wish, as I totally recall. See what I mean? That was a great movie I did to, with, with Jamie Lee Curtis and James Cameron, and neither one of those two support you, and now you're using that. You, you can't keep on doing this. That's it's exactly the media true lie right there. That's, That's what I mean. You can't say that. I don't know. Whatever became of us, Arnold? We used to be like brothers, like twins. That's the last straw. I can't take it anymore. There's something wrong with you. You must have something in your brain. It's not a tumor. Ah! Just... That's it. That's it. That's from Kindergarten Cop. You can't steal that. You know what? You're fired. You can't fire me. I don't work for you anymore. I quit. I want you to get Pence on the line right away, Mike Pence. We're gonna send him down to Mar-a-Lago and we're gonna put a stop to this Arnold business. Tell him to run, go, get to the chopper. No, I heard that. Knock it off now or I'll be back. Unlike you in 2020, I'll be back. Get him out. And now. The further future adventures of Starship, Starship Winkler. The captain and the ship's doctor are attending a medical convention. And that's how gigawatts can be used to cure chronic incontinence. Thank you, thank you. And now I'd like to send everybody back, back to the buffet line. Nice speech there, Doc. Yes, nice speech. Ooh, it's time for the keynote speaker. So, which doctor is speaking first? Doctor who? The doctor speaking first. Who? The guy on first. Who? What's the name of the doctor speaking first? Who's on first? I don't know. That's why I'm asking you. Well, tune in next time when we hear... Third, Third base. base. On Starship, Starship Winkler. You're not sure. I'll give you the alternative. You're not sure. You've got to create 30 million jobs over three years. Yeah. 
Tell me what companies can do that. So first tell me of what all, 20 or 50 or 100 companies I, can do that. I can't tell you a specific companies that can do that because I don't know. In fact, or investors. I, I, but, but, but what the I don't, greatest investors of right. all time. Well, but I don't presume to think that I know who's going to be the best investor or the best company to do that. Just as I don't think the government is, uh, that I could presume that the government's going to be effective to do that. Gonna talk money. Gonna talk politics with all generations. Oh, what a great mix! I said, has been on a determined campaign to convince the world that everything is hunky dory. And when the government actually spends so much effort trying to convince you of something, uh, you got to be very suspicious. Uh, your lawyers don't tell you even all the evidence that the government has given them, the few meager disclosures that were made literally at the 11th hour after he'd already been coerced into pleading guilty. Hours of video evidence of Nancy Pelosi coming up on your porches and jujitsuing your precious packages while Chuck Schumer waits in the street in the getaway van because he's too afraid to be a man and do his own dirty work. Come on, Jimmy, what you got? Is it scary that YouTube and Twitter and, and Facebook have this kind of power over us? Of course it is, but you know what? These things didn't always exist and they won't always exist. David beat Goliath. The little guy can beat the big guy. So we have to figure out ways to fight in which we are able to have that kind of reach. We can build our own megaphones. Um, and this is gonna take, this is a little bit of a longer term project. It goes beyond Trump's uh, re-election because it affects every election. I'm good, man. We're a part. It's a partnership. We're like this, Jimmy. I, we got, I got you. Jimmy, can I tell you that I've done about 200 shows in the last three weeks for this book tour. This has been by far my favorite interview. And that, my friends, is how America was made great once again. Breaking at this hour, Jimmy Sangenberger is currently at the crossroads of politics and economics. Radio broadcaster master. Now the celeb on the web. He's the smarty of the party. He's in cahoots with the grassroots. Jimmy at the Crossroads brings you thought-provoking commentary, hard-hitting interviews, original satire, and the best bumper music known to man, Jimmy at the Crossroads. I got Jimmy at the Crossroads, making sense out of no sin. And ladies and gentlemen, let's get back to your host of the crossroads. He can show you the light of the right in the blink of an eye. Jimmy Sagenberger. We're talking with the man who most definitely saw the light of the right. We'll get back to Dr. Marv Traeger in just a moment here. But indeed, welcome back to Jimmy at the Crossroads. I am Jimmy Sagenberger coming to you in partnership with the Washington Examiner, such a pleasure and a privilege to be with you on this Free to Choose Friday, June 26th. If you have not done so already, please do subscribe to the YouTube channel, Jimmy at the Crossroads, youtube.com slash Jimmy at the Crossroads. Follow me on Twitter at Sang Center, Sang with an E, not an A, Center on Twitter and on Facebook, facebook.com slash Jimmy Sangenberger Pro. We'll get you right to... The Facebook page, Jimmy Sangenberger, media personality. And keep in mind, there's no A, there's no I, there's no U in Sangenberger. It's all E's all the time. Once you know that, Sangenberger is easy. And by the way, if you go to shop.jimmyatthecrossroads.com or you could just go to jimmyatthecrossroads.com you can join the Crossroads Club at the top or you can go to the shop. At the, there's a link in the menu as well. But we have... The all-new, all-ees, all-the-time t-shirt available there for purchase. Be sure to check it out. Also, follow our friends at the Washington Examiner, WashingtonExaminer.com, and on YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter. 
So I am so pleased to have on the line today very special guest, Dr. Marv Traeger, who is a retired psychotherapist, Ph.D., doctorate in psychology. He is also a former Marxist radical who is so far to the left, as we've been talking with him about, that at one point, the 50th anniversary of the Bolshevik Revolution, he and a group of comrades bolted from the Communist Party because it wasn't communist enough. It was kind of communist in name only, not far enough to the left. Well, in this century in particular, he had his roto-rooter process that eroded that leftism and became a conservative and now is even a strong supporter of President Donald Trump. At Marv, it is so great once again to have you here. Thanks for sticking around today and being a part of the program. We, we really got in the first segment into some depth about understanding some of the identity politics roots on the left and also your own ideological development over time from being someone who helped Bernadine Dorn tweak a speech in the 1960s and who was involved in very many different uh, radical movements and so forth back then on to becoming a conservative now. Today, you might have seen in the news a thing or two about a little bit of civil unrest that's going on in the country today. And there was so much of what you said at a few different points in the first segment that just really resonated with the dynamics today. And I do want to talk about some of these different elements, but I've spoken long enough, so please sort of set the stage here on what's your sense is for what we're seeing. Well, you know, I was the first thing that I think is worth noting, uh, that I've noted, is that uh, the demonstrations that are going on right now, the protests, uh, the rioting, the looting, um, uh, have a certain uh, di a different quality than they did in the 60s, um, particularly during the civil rights movement. Uh, a, a, what did a peaceful protest look like in in, in uh, the civil rights movement? Well, you might have uh, 30 people across the front line, maybe Martin Luther King and Ralph Abernathy and and all of the different uh, leaders, and then people behind them and holding signs and protesting and uh, uh, you know, and then they would have monitors so that the demonstrators monitored their own forces. For the most part, you didn't need the police to monitor it. In fact, uh, the police uh, in the South uh, would attack the march and were the opponents of the march. So when violence erupted, it, it, it erupted because of a police attack on a peaceful march. Now, the protesters like to, uh, to talk about the right of assembly and the right of peaceful protest, and absolutely, <laughs> that's a, a proper thing to do. However, what we have in these uh, marches is you have something that, um, you know, maybe begins and starts like a peaceful protest, but it starts to involve uh, um, provoking and confronting the police and haranguing the police. And then people start lobbing things from the back and um, egging on the police to do something, and, and bricks are thrown and stones are thrown. And then the so-called peaceful protesters, they don't try to stop the people who are doing that in the back. They're, you know, that's, that's all you know, part of them as far as they're concerned. Uh, and then as, uh, as uh, day uh, turns into night, um, the level of violence steps up, and the afternoon's peaceful protester becomes an evening's violent protester. Uh, now, added to that, you have um, uh, organized groups like Antifa that um, generally the, uh, you know, little, generally the left um, tends to work uh, through uh, mass movements where they lead the mass movements, but they hide their own full program. And um, but in these uh, and that's a generalization, but in these uh, demonstrations, you actually have groups with their own specific program like Antifa who hide themselves because they're engaged in so much violence and uh, Black Lives Matter movement. And um, and that movement is led by Marxists, uh, the co the founder that you can go on the Internet and find it, uh, uh, you know, supports um, Marxism and was answering a question from an interviewer that said, 
uh, tell me what's going to happen to the Black Lives uh, movement? Is is it um, is it going to disintegrate? Is it going to dissolve once the demonstration? No, no, no. We have a we're ideological. We have a, we're Marxists. We're trained Marxists, and we're organized. And then another leader of the um, of the movement uh, said uh, that uh, with regard to these uh, stained glass windows and statues in Europe that uh, Jesus' uh, images should be smashed. And um, this was because um, Jesus was portrayed uh, as a Caucasian in, um, uh, in many of these images. And, of course, Jesus was portrayed uh, in all sorts of countries, more or less looking like the people of that country, uh, just for the sake of uh, easier identification. But that was enough to want this uh, this organization and this guy to destroy um yeah and, and, um, those and Marv, kinds of... i also i do have the we do have the tweet actually and, and for those watching oh, we're gonna really? have nathan matouche put the tweet up on the screen this is uh sean king one of the leaders of the black lives matter movement and you're right he, he exactly he was specifically talking about how White supremacy was exemplified in stained glass windows of, quote, white Jesus, and therefore they needed to be taken down. And one of the things that I was expressing the other day is a concern about how they might go for – they've already been tearing down statues. I wouldn't be surprised if some of these people start actually – destroying stained glass windows in churches across the country. Now, I hope that's not the case, but I wouldn't be surprised if it was. Um, don't be surprised. Yeah, um, exactly. Look, when, when, they're, when, when they're destroying statues, so that's what they're doing. Those are uh, uh, objects, right, with symbolic and, and with, with great attention without anybody voting on it or any democratic decision to remove it or anything like that, any discussion. So it's completely undemocratic and it's complete mob rule. But in addition to that, they're engaged in cancel culture uh, through the internet and through pressure on organizations and businesses. Anyone who steps out of line loses their job and is out. So if you, if you're uh, destroying statues and you're canceling the culture of people pretty soon, it will reach the point it seems to me, when they will start taking out people. I mean, where does it has to go to that next step well, at Marv, some point along we, the line? We have seen some extremists already who have beaten elderly women, for example. Um, now, I do want to say that I think I, I talk with a lot of people who believe in Black Lives Matter, are supporters of the cause, but what most people, I think, believe, and even most of the people who show up to these during-the-day protests, most of them believe, hey, there is racial injustice, there's excessive policing that particularly targets people of color, especially black people, and we need reform. And they genuinely believe that there needs to be change. But then you have this fringe group that has all of this... Uh, this sense of strength that they can go out there and bring down all the statues or loot property or burn down courthouses and what have you, particularly because they can get away with it. My contention is that those people are less serious about some kind of genuine, at least racial improvement cause and have either a much more radical agenda or they're just trying to push the limits to see how far they can go with destroying private property and even public property and eradicating property protection and this notion of property rights, how far they can go before the police will intervene. So I think most of the people who say they support Black Lives Matter genuinely believe that as, as something sincere but not radical. And then you have these radical elements. However, where there's a rub is the radical and extremists that are destroying property are not only getting away with it because the police aren't acting to stop it, but they're getting away with it because others who say they support Black Lives Matter are for one reason or another unwilling to condemn that kind of activity. And I think for most it's out of fear, but in some cases you may see some of the more extreme elements who may find themselves thinking, you know what, this is okay with me, let them do it if they want to. Well, you know, I don't think that uh, it's very clear what uh, the um, Black Lives Matter movement and in general what the reforms that are being sought are. Right. 
Um, as, a, as a matter of fact, in most of the city, remember all of these cities, just about all of them, um, are uh, run by the Democratic Party. Um, uh, Atlanta, for example, uh, the police force is 58% African American. The mayor is black. The, the, um, uh, uh, the you know the, the, the whole was, structure of the police chief was also black. So so um, uh, and there have been reforms, and you're not finding in those places. Uh, and the statistics do not show, um, uh, you know, like in the number of dead blacks killed by whites versus the number of whites killed by black, you know, police officers and all of that kind of stuff. Pretty much this is not fundamentally a problem anymore. Here's what is a problem, and it's more subtle. And that is that there is still a tendency, um, which is pretty much true in large parts of the country, for um, if you're an African-American, uh, you're liable to be looked over more by a policeman, right. um, whether the policeman's black or white. Um, it's, a, it's a subtle form of profiling. And, um, and, and that's because there is so much crime that comes out of the black community uh, and, and the gangs and all of that kind of stuff. So therefore, I would you know, I think that uh, that that subtler form, which many African Americans do suffer um, uh, still to this day, um, it's but it's harder to address, and it certainly isn't being addressed by any clear demand. So, for example, the demand to reform the police union. Well, um, uh, you know, there is in some police unions the continuation of the code of blue, where they protect one another, and um, uh, uh, the union is behind that, and sometimes that you know leans in the direction of um, of um, uh, a, a racial component, but it also can lean in another direction as well. Um, but the police unions also help get the wages of policemen up, so it's a it's also a mixed bag. So all of these things are are are, are really a mixed bag. But the key thing I think we need to understand is that none of this would be happening if it were not for the Democratic Party. Everything that happens this year, I don't care what it is, is about the elections. You know, if somebody blows their nose, it's about the elections. So all of these things are being enfolded into the election process, and the Democrats, who were so desperate at Trump uh, sailing to victory uh, in the prosperity uh, uh, is now trying to politicize both the COVID-19 uh, uh, pandemic and these riots and trying to blame them on Trump and blame them on Republicans, even though this is the consequence of 50 years of Democratic rule in the cities where the riots are taking place. Well, and, I, and yeah. how... Yeah, th yeah, let me jump in well, and just, I just add that. To, you, go ahead. Yeah, just, just real quickly, I would want to say that in those inner cities, the socioeconomic conditions are the driving factors, and you do tend to find minorities and, and, and blacks, especially African Americans, in inner cities where the socioeconomic conditions are much, uh, much more challenging for people, which is why I think you see a lot of the, the crime that happens in those areas being more pronounced. And yes, those cities are run by Democrats. Go ahead. Well, uh, and and um, and and you know, some of the ar the arguments are that the police are too brutal, you know, with people, and that, that. Uh, that that fall it fall and it falls on black, and and some of the police are, but uh, th for the most part, they, they're now wearing body cams. They're this. They're they're, they're called up on it. Uh, there's all kinds of, of of obstacles. But in Chicago, the problem is that the police won't do anything about the horrendous mass slaughter going on between the gangs on the south side and the west side of Chicago. And there's no attention paid to that, and the police do not in intervene. And the right. police chiefs in every one of these cities is in the pocket of the mayor. And it's a Democratic mayor and a Democratic police chief. And frankly, um, uh, the, the mainstream media is the principal force sure. that that uh, these guys have to right. try so, to put pin this on Trump? 
Right. D Dr. Marv Traeger, again, our guest, former Marxist radical back in the 1960s turned conservative. One thing that you said in the first segment when we were talking about the, the nature of the left back in the 60s, the, the Marxist movements, the radical movements, was that, uh, that the black Marxist leaders ended up sort of taking greater positions of authority compared to the white Marxist leaders who basically, it seemed, seeded that sort of a, a leadership a position in that way. Can you expand on that and kind of tie in what we're seeing right now with Black Lives Matter in particular and the radical elements of that and how it's panning out on the far left? Well, uh, you know, you have um, uh, white young people in their 20s and 30s, uh, uh, often college graduates, um, who are, um, you know, uh, the, you could say that a large majority uh, of the of the protesters, and um, and and they have bought a bill of goods uh, at at the universities and the colleges, where um, a generation of of '60s graduates be, became Marxist professors. I mean, think about it. I mean, you know, even Bernadine Dorn and, and Bill Ayers, who, who you know were engaged in bombings and things like that. Uh, end up on the faculties uh, and, and guests and honored guests of uh, different universities. And th it doesn't stop there. The, the, it goes on and on. Well, so they're the product of all that. So one of the things that's different today, which I was going to mention earlier, is that um, I would say, whereas the people protesting in the 60s were still very pro-American, um, uh, even in the uh, anti-war movement, um, the uh, the marchers today are really shaky about their um, understanding, confidence, and support for the American uh, experiment and vision. They're ignorant of it, for one thing, but they also, uh, because of things like the 1619 project that the New York Times has uh, pushed and publicized, they have a substitute ideology that this was a racist country born in 1619, not 1776, and that it's, uh, it's an original sin and it can never be eradicated. Uh, you can change this and change that, but you'll never, ever completely get rid of white privilege. So the whole structure has to be torn down. And a lot of the, um, the mass of the protesters, in one way or another, to some degree, support that vision. And that's what makes this particularly dangerous. So, uh, Dr. Marv Traeger, back in the 1960s, I mean, the Black Panther movement was the leading part of the Marxist movement. Um, and I, as I recall, I mean, you had dated a, a black woman, if I recall correctly. The Black Panther said, no, you can't continue uh, with, with, with the relationship. But uh, talk to us a little bit about that dynamic back in the 60s in terms of the Marxist movement and the, the, the racial angles there on to today and what we're seeing with the, with the movements right now. Well, um, as I mentioned, SDS has thought of itself as uh, students that, for a democratic society. So the question, right, students for a democratic society, which was this mass student organization, which became increasingly radical and Marxist, they thought of themselves um, as an auxiliary to the true modern uh, proletarian revolutionary, who was the uh, uh, African American, the, the black militant. Uh, because they were the most oppressed. So, um, so who was going to lead the revolution? Not the working class, but the most oppressed. So who were the most oppressed? Well, those who were racially uh, under thumb. So therefore, uh, a kind of weird identity politics whereby whatever ideology the most oppressed expressed, then that was what we all had to get on board with. And if we challenged it, we could be challenged in terms of our credentials for being white or middle class or um, and and you know all of that is morphed until it, you're pretty much if you're an older white male uh, heterosexual gendered uh, uh, you know right. oriented I person yes yeah then you know then 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 you got nothing to say buddy well you know so in other words, it's not just you're, about working history. class it's not just about working class. The, the proletariat you you've got um, you've got people who actually are um, 
you know, they're, they're basing things along other lines for most oppressed and, and categorizing people versus has it always has it long been that way? It's not just the working class. It's underneath the working class. You then have a hierarchy. Uh, yeah, that and uh, uh, and that was uh, like and their little tweet. That's what I meant. Marxism. But not not proletariat. I'm sorry. Yeah, Go they, ahead. Yeah, they tweaked Marxism uh, that way. Uh, Marxism had his own underclass. It was called the lumpen proletariat, who were people who were declassed and were broken, and true. were, uh, according to Marx, used as police spies. But what we need is a pushback, um, Jimmy, uh, because all of this is taking place and. And the Republicans are, you know, other than a few, are really just unwilling to, you know, say anything. And um, uh, they're just kind of watching and waiting. And I think that this is, uh, you know, it'll all peter out. Uh, It'll all kind of exhaust itself. Uh, Things will go back to normal. No, it's not like that. Uh, They're just going onward and onward, and it's going to go continue. So I think there has to be a pushback, and I think that the Trump campaign has not has got to retool. I th- I think that unless they retool, they're going to end up in trouble. And uh, so, for example, um, make America great again. I-, I don't think that's an appropriate slogan for this coming election. Here's why: because make America great again, uh, it was new, it was fresh, it caught the imagination of people. It was last election's slogan. If you they try to use it, it again, to yeah. what? The, the, keep America great, CAG. Keep America well, but, great. Yeah, but that's, but that's down the toilet because it's COVID came oh, yes. and uh, the riots came. Right. So, right. I was just it. clarifying, MAGA's, MAGA's out. I mean, people still say it, but MAGA's not their slogan. It was keep America great. But So what do you think should be the slogan? Mm. Well, you know, that's hard to figure out because I think it should be related to the concept of preserving the American way of life. I think what's really under threat right now is is our way of life, uh, a certain sense of normalcy, of legality, of law and order, of um, opportunity, of um, you know, all these things. So um, a friend of mine came up with a couple of words. And I think that they would work because they'll fit in a hat, they'll fit, they'll fit in a T-shirt. America matters. Hmm. Very simple. America matters. Trump gets up, he gives a rally, and he, he, he says, America matters. And then he, he develops 15 reasons why it matters. And then the people have the hats. And I love that particular phrase. Because, you see, it allows the person who reads it or hears it or listens to it, just like you went, hmm, um, it allows their mind to kind of almost go across the whole scope of what we've achieved and what we've come to and the good aspect and the positive aspect, which has enabled all of these things to happen. So I think uh, America matters. (laughs) It, it really matters, and it would make a great slogan. Interesting. And, and the left does like to say truth matters, facts matters, this matters, that matters. So it, you kind it, of play exactly. into their black, language. Yeah. Black, black lives matter, mm-hmm. all lives matter. Well, the point about this is that it captures it all, but sure. it puts it under America, so, and America is the thing they're after. Right. Let me let me ask you one more question about what we're seeing now, Dr. Marv Traeger, again, our guest, former Marxist radical turned conservative, a psychotherapist, retired psychotherapist and a Buddhist teacher. When we talk about what's happening in the country today in terms of these social dynamics and the economic dynamics and the cultural dynamics, I mean, a lot of things that are in flux and in play right now. What do you think conservatives need to know in order to be effective, and maybe this kind of ties in with your America Matters, but to be effective in messaging against this radical leftist ideology that seems to be spreading like wildfire right now? Well, I think, uh, uh, okay, well, uh, I I, I laid out, you you might say, what is the basis of what the messaging ought to be. But, Jimmy, I think there's something more important than messaging, Mm. and that is um, being down with the people. 
if, if I mean, I'm in my 80s now, so uh, it's not the right time for me to be doing this. But um, if I were younger, I would move into an African-American neighborhood. That's all. Hmm. That's, that's what communists do when they want to build something. They get down and gritty. You know, we, 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 can't, we can't just live these uh, over here quiet, comfortable lives. Now, I think that that's going to be uh, – that's a tough one. That's a tough bridge to uh, – but I remember in the Romney campaign, I went to Ohio. I volunteered for three months in the Josh Mandel Senate campaign and so helped support the Romney campaign. And I was trying to get the, the uh, Republicans at that time to um, hold rallies or do things in the African-American community, and, and they just wouldn't do it. They, they just you know, pretty much wrote it off. Now, Trump doesn't have that attitude. Trump, uh, he himself makes connection, and his people make connection, right. and there's the black churches. But I think ultimately the, uh, the, the, the African-American community has to be the main place where, where this is, uh, uh, action takes place on the ground and where they rise up uh, uh, because uh, otherwise right. the psychic culture of a people can't be changed unless the people themselves are doing it. Yeah, you, so, engagement. Um, that's the word. Engage the people. It, thank you. Engagement. Th- that's what you need to be doing. And I agree with you. In 2012, I remember other complaints in Colorado about the campaign not trying to exert any kind of effort in minority communities, the Romney campaign. And so that seems to be something yep. that was pretty common across the country. Uh, Marv Traeger, I want to shift gears to one more final question for you. I want to play a clip of our patron economist here on Jimmy at the Crossroads on Free to Choose Fridays, Milton Friedman, in Cut 3. Milton Friedman was in an exchange, I think, in 1979 with Phil Donahue, where he was asked about and talking about fairness. And I think this is apropos because so many Americans today who seem to be drawn into the left are just wanting a fairer society. And I want to play this clip of Friedman in exchange with Phil Donahue and then get your reaction. And freedom is not fairness. Fairness means somebody has to decide what's fair. And that means the FCC people have to decide what's fair. And I don't want the FCC people to decide for me what I should listen to or hear. And you wouldn't be able, if the public at large didn't agree with your choices, you'd be out of business. Yeah, I would. So you, you, you know, it's a funny thing. People think that uh, it's the appearance of power versus the reality of power. It looks like as if you have a lot of power over what you put on your shelf. But you don't. Really? Because... <laughs> Because if you didn't appeal to the public, if these people didn't like you, do a marvelous job. I'm not questioning that. But you do a marvelous job because you have found uh, an audience for your product. Uh, so in other words, my power comes from the people. Is your power. Absolutely. And they- Freedom is the ability to decide for yourself what is fair. And Friedman also said something, I'm paraphrasing here, that if you prioritize equality over freedom, you will get neither. What do you make of that? Yeah. Well, you know, fairness is, is, you know, if there's one word that you could say uh, all Americans, uh, right, left, radical, conservative, it doesn't matter. If there's one word that is in our DNA, it's the word fairness. Mm -hmm. We want things to be fair and we don't want them to not be fair. And, um, uh, And Milton is completely right. You, you can't, uh, impose fairness because who's going to impose it? Fairness has to come out of your own choices and your 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 own freedom. So, um, I, I, yeah, I really think that that uh, he hit the nail on the head, and I'm, I'm happy to hop on his coattails four decades too late <laughs> there you go me me too and I, w- I wasn't even alive in 79 you were still a leftist back during that time period, yeah well so. yeah so i have less excuse <laughs> yes ex- exactly right and i'll just add this in terms of fairness before we let you go and that is look fairness needs to be before the law equal equal protection under the law being treated fairly by the government. And one example of this leftist radicalism that we're seeing on display where fairness isn't isn't being prioritized is in Washington state. You might have seen this. They're requiring everybody to wear a mask, but in Lincoln County, Washington, if you're a person of color and you feel concerned about wearing a mask, you don't have to. There's an exception there. 
That doesn't seem to be fair or to fit under the idea of equal protection under the law, particularly under the 14th Amendment of the Constitution. Yeah. Uh, sadly, there are more examples every day that it's almost impossible to keep up with it. It is indeed. Dr. Marv Traeger, what a fascinating conversation. We could just go on and on and on. It was nice not having more than one break, too. That's kind of neat once we got things going. Thanks so much for joining us today here on Jimmy at the Crossroads. I'm sure we'll have you back. Thank you, Jimmy. I really appreciate your inviting me. Same here for you coming on. Thank you, my friend. Dr. Marv Traeger again joining us. Ex-Marxist radical turned conservative after that roto-rooter process with his Buddhist faith. And solitary retreat in 2001, particularly bringing about this evolution. We need to ensure in America that we remain free to think, free to act, and free to choose. And that's why we do Free to Choose Fridays, covering a range of important topics. That is it for us today. Tomorrow night, 710K in US in Denver, 5 to 8 p.m. Be sure to tune in then. We will have some great programming coming up next week as well here on Jimmy at the Crossroads. Be sure to subscribe to the YouTube channel, youtube.com slash Jimmy at the Crossroads, and join the membership program, members.jimmyatthecrossroads.com, or just go to jimmyatthecrossroads.com where you can access the shop, join the membership program, all of our content, and so much more. Have a great weekend. Thanks to Marv Traeger, the Washington Examiner, Nathan Matouche, working the Matouche magic, and to you. And, of course, have a great weekend, and may God bless America.